Hello, everyone, and welcome to the New Mexico Wellbeing Committee's podcast series, Legal Wellbeing in Action. My name is Tanessa Aikens, and I will be the host of this series. I am the clinical coordinator for the New Mexico State Bar's Judges and Lawyers Assistance Program. I am also a member of the New Mexico Wellbeing Committee that was formed in 2019. With me today is Pamela Moore, director of the New Mexico Judges and Lawyers Assistance Program, and also a member of the New Mexico Wellbeing Committee. Hello, Pam. Hello, Tanessa. Thank you for the opportunity to introduce Legal Wellbeing in Action, a podcast series offered by the New Mexico Wellbeing Committee. Last year was the first full year of the New Mexico Wellbeing Committee at work. In identifying ways to bring well-being education and initiatives to the New Mexico legal community, we created a 2021 campaign called What a Healthy Lawyer Looks Like. 2021 is dedicated to educating the New Mexico legal community on a variety of well-being topics that pertain to work and home life. Our goal is that every judge, lawyer, law student, and legal staff person can find some aspect of their mental, emotional, physical, or spiritual health to improve upon. We strive to educate, encourage, and support the New Mexico legal community to show up as their best self in all aspects of life, which means we will be covering a wide variety of topics that relate to the whole human self. Thank you for being here today, and thank you for listening to Legal Wellbeing in Action. Today's episode, Lawyering by Video, will feature two of New Mexico's local private practice attorneys, Richard Cravens and Sean Fitzpatrick. Richard and Sean will be sharing their experiences of practicing law in a video setting, while also discussing the possibility to continue to use these video settings well after the pandemic is gone. To introduce both Rick and Sean, Richard Cravens works in a private practice, and his practice primarily focuses on personal injury and complex litigation. However, he also represents homeowners in the foreclosure process. Richard has been a volunteer member of the Judges and Lawyers Assistance Program and the University of New Mexico Health Sciences Center Biomedical Ethics Committee since he was a second year law student. Sean Fitzpatrick also works in a private practice and has founded Fitzpatrick Law in 2016. Currently, Fitzpatrick Law focuses on injury and insurance law. Sean is also the current co-chair to the New Mexico Wellbeing Committee. With that, I will let Rick and Sean take it away. We hope you enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Pam, and thank you, Tanessa, for that introduction. Um, and thank you, Sean, for being here. Uh, my name is Rick Cravens. Um, I'm an attorney here in Albuquerque. I started as an insurance defense lawyer um, and I've had my own practice since uh, April Fool's Day, 2014. I do mostly personal injury, uh, some complex and commercial litigation, and I still have about a dozen foreclosure defense cases, which I did not want to learn, but which allowed me to open my practice in the first place. So I am very grateful for it. Um, Sean, it's a pleasure to meet you. Nice to meet you, Rick. Uh, I'm uh, happy to be here uh, with you on this topic and a little bit about myself. I uh, started out at the DA's office up in Farmington back in 2012. And then in about 2016, uh, I started uh, doing personal injury work and my practice now in Albuquerque uh, is about 50-50 uh, insurance, uh, insurance issues, insurance bad faith for plaintiffs and personal injury and uh, happy to talk about the uh, lawyering by video with you, Rick. Well, thanks, I'm I, 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 uh, glad you mentioned that. Today we're talking about lawyering by video, um, especially during this COVID-19 crisis and, uh, and, and talk a little bit for the future. Um, I, when um, we started having some real impacts uh, to our ability to do stuff in person but last March, uh, 2020, um, I was pretty busy. Um, I had to find a way to keep doing stuff. Um, when I, uh, I had a hearing, uh, a, a bench trial coming up, uh, which actually occurred on May 4th, uh, 2020. Uh, we did that by video. Um, but I have people in my house who cannot get sick. Uh, we've been pretty much in quarantine since late March and early April. Uh, we still get deliveries. We still sanitize everything. Um, 
I have, we don't take any chances with anybody's health here. Uh, like I said, we have fragile people, so we, we just really don't take any chances. I don't plan on stepping foot in the courtroom again until we're all vaccinated. Um, I haven't been able to conduct a trial, a hearing, a deposition or mediation in person since April of last year. That doesn't mean I haven't been busy. Uh, as a matter of fact, in some ways, I have been able to get more stuff done now than I ever did before because I can stack stuff on top of each other. I can have a hearing out in Sandoval within 15 minutes of a hearing in, in Albuquerque and actually make it to both of those and not piss off a judge. Um, you know, and it's funny, when we started this stuff, it's not like I'm extremely competent at this stuff. Uh, at my first Zoom meeting, I had to jump on by phone because I couldn't figure out how to turn on my microphone on my computer. Everybody's waving at me and pointing to the little buttons and stuff. And it was actually, I wasn't competent to turn on the microphone to my computer. I had to have my IT guy help me out. So believe me, if I can do this stuff, um, it really, literally any human being can do this if I can do it. Um, but I had a lovely time at our, our first, uh, our first uh, video trial, uh, which is an evidentiary hearing out in Albuquerque. Uh, it was all day. Uh, but, but I had a lovely time. Um, John, I understand that you've got, that you've done some stuff by video and you've also got a trial coming up. Yeah, well, I, um, I had a, well, my experience is a little bit different than yours, Rick, in that I considered myself competent, uh, but then when it came time to perform, uh, you know, everything went wrong with, with, with these different uh, depositions by video. Um, you know, you, I, I run a Mac out of my office, um, and, you know, sharing the screen on a Mac requires a system admin change to your password. So of course I'm trying to share my screen during the deposition and it's not recognizing my password for the admin screen. And turns out I have to do a hard reset of the Apple chip hardware in the computer. Of course, I figured this out after the deposition. Uh, and eventually I had to rely on my um, co-counsel to share their screen and pull up the exhibits for the deposition. And it was just not fun. Uh, but uh, lesson learned uh, on that and hopefully we'll carry forward to trial uh, in, uh, let's see, four, five days now. So it'll be, uh, we'll be doing a somewhat of a hybrid trial uh, in Clayton, New Mexico on the 8th, Monday, next week. Wow, good luck. So, <laughs> I, got all kinds of, I got all kinds of questions because you, are you going to be doing this in person? Are you going to be doing this by video or how's that going right. to work? Yeah, so it's going to be a hybrid. So uh, we will be, the parties will be in person, the attorneys will be in person, uh, the jurors will be in person, everyone will be masked, everyone will be social distanced. Uh, and um, it's interesting because, you know, when you have multiple attorneys, in this case for the uh, plaintiff, uh, who gets to sit at counsel table? Uh, you know, I, I mean, I joke, well, we'll you know, but who, which, which plaintiff, if there's multiple plaintiffs, if there's only two people at counsel table, then does plaintiff, plaintiff doesn't even get to sit at counsel table because of the social distancing requirements. So it's going to be in person, but there will be some witnesses who are going to be uh, testifying remotely, and uh, they will um, hopefully. Hopefully, that'll probably be assuming everything goes right. Knock on wood. Uh, those will be the easiest portions of the uh, trial because they'll be unmasked. Should be easier to understand them. Uh, when you have jurors sitting all throughout the courtroom, not just in the gallery, the gallery, uh, and you have a mask on, and you're trying to project to everyone. Uh, I imagine I will be hoarse at the end of the week. Well, and, and you, you're going to have to have separate exhibits for everybody, right? Because you can't pass things from each other. And except that you got to get electronic stuff to the guys on video, right? Yeah. So, uh, you know, despite it, most things being digital nowadays, uh, and especially during the, the pandemic, being able to do things digitally, unfortunately for the jurors, we are printing out 14 individual juror books. Uh, with proposed exhibits to those jurors numbering at about 150 pages. So I don't know if you can hear it, but my printers are currently whirring in the, uh, the office. So it uh, will, uh, uh, so yeah, so that's going to be uh, a logistical 
uh, issue because, of course, some some exhibits are admitted and stipulated to, and some are not. So then, how do you get fourteen copies? Because you have twelve jurors and two alternates. Uh, fourteen copies of each exhibit to each individual juror. I'm I'm sure we'll figure it out, but it's going to be uh, a little bit. Uh, it's definitely going to be more challenging than back, you know, in the the pre-COVID era. And of course, you know, how, how easy do you anticipate it's going to be to read your jurors when you cannot see their faces? Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, I think the answer is, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, you'll still be able to look at their body language, like crossed arms and and all these things, but uh, facial expressions, that we're not going to be able to look at that. Um, and then, of course. Normally in Vaudeer, you'll be able to, you have the jurors in a certain area where you can see them, but since the jurors will be throughout the courtroom, you know, our back will be turned to some of them, uh, depending on where they're seated. And uh, so very limited information through the nonverbal cues that you would normally get in a Vaudeer selection process. You know, I have thought that, you know, jurors do not trust lawyers to begin with. I do not know how putting a mask on is going to help that. Ah, well, uh, that's, yeah, I think, uh, I think we'll, you know, we'll have to have some questions about that, but uh, maybe if I, if I put a little happy face on my mask, then maybe it'll, it'll be better. <laughs> I don't think the judge is going to allow that, but uh, yeah, that, I mean, absolutely something to hide with a mask on. That'll be something to think about. You know, it's funny, that's, that's such a contrast with what I had, uh, like my first uh, bench trial was uh, here in Second Judicial. It was all day long. We'd been prepping for it. We actually had this coming for years. It was the second day of a, a two-day evidentiary hearing that actually had nine months between the two. But um, and they, and they're difficult parties that couldn't come to any kind of you know stuff. But we did have the benefit the week before um, our judge uh, was kind enough in our pre-trial conference to uh, give us a chance to practice with Google Meets including he made us put up exhibits on, you know, uh, uh, present exhibits and things like that on the screen. So, and he was very patient. I think, you know, that was probably key in every single thing I have done by video right now, and including that trial was patience. You know, everybody has been patient for all the other attorneys, patient for witnesses, everybody that needs to participate in this process, you know, hopefully understanding that we're in, this is a, hopefully a temporary crisis situation. Um, and we got to get through it one way or another. And I think in, in some ways, we just got to find a way to get the job done. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. Let me ask you this. When when you did that um, that trial, did you ask the judge for uh, to a practice run or did he tell you to do it? Or how did that work? He actually made the opportunity there because I think it was his first one as well. Because um, we were this was, it was back in uh, May 4th uh, of last year. And we had just, I mean, what was it, March 11th, we had our first orders kind of, you know, making it difficult to do things in person. The courts were coming out with, you know, decisions on how to approach this thing. And so um, our, our judge, who was, I, I think, uh, a relatively new judge, but he was, I think, willing to uh, adopt this. And I've had, since then, I've had numerous hearings with the same judge by Google Meets, and they've all been very successful. Um, frankly, between you and me, the older I get, the easier it is for me to see people on my screen than it is 20 or 30 feet away from them in the courtroom. Uh, it's easier for me to, you know, it's easier for me to, if I, these days I do a bunch of meetings by Zoom and Google Meet and stuff. I have a gallery of people. I can click a button. I can make your face as big as my giant high def screen here. I can see micro expressions if you're a juror. Um, you know, it's like I get a whole gallery. I could have, you know, if I had the money, of course, I'm on the plaintiff's side. So I always dream about what I would do if I had all the money to do these trials the right way. If I had a, you know, a team of jury consultants behind me, they could have all the juries on their own screens. You know, we yeah. could have them blown yeah. up. Have we you seen that? Have you seen that show, uh, Lie to Me? Uh, there's a TV show that talks about Lie to Me and, it, and there's micro expressions and, and all that stuff. Yeah. 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 So you could you could have those those experts uh, behind you doing the jury analysis, right? Exactly, and you know, frankly, I could do it from the comfort of my chair. I have all of my documents on my screens. I don't have to lug this giant thing around, and and God forbid, which I swear has never happened more than twice, uh, I have forgotten documents back at my office that I desperately needed for trial. Um, I have uh, the comfort to actually get all this stuff done uh, in a in a and this is what's going to be my next question, in a 100% safe environment, 
100% safe for you and 100% safe for me. I can do business with you. I could do business right now with you if I tested positive for COVID and was actively having symptoms as long as I wasn't bedridden, I could still get the job done. You know, and I, I was going to ask you what kind of um, safety precautions or protocols are they going to have at the courthouse for everybody who does show up in person? Yeah. Uh, the first thing, of course, is a COVID uh, screening questionnaire. So has anyone, have you had any symptoms? Has anyone in your house had symptoms? Has anyone tested positive? Those are all going to be uh, part of the, the screening process to jurors and to witnesses, um, I believe, if I'm recalling correctly. Um, and then they're also going to have a secure entrance point into the courthouse uh, where the people will be temperature tested as they enter. Uh, and then, of course, everyone will be six feet apart, masks, masks required at all times. Um, and then, you know, no, um, no, I won't be able to whis whisper in my co-counsel's ear. That's for sure. I'll have to uh, figure out a way to communicate either through uh, digital device or, or, or walkie-talkies, although I'm not sure I, I want a walkie-talkie in my ear. Um, but as far as that, I mean, just your just your standard um, safety precautions. I think that most districts are implementing for jury trials. And I have not seen anything anywhere that will guarantee 100 percent safety in that process. Right. I mean, it's a risk. It's a risk. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it's uh, it's a risk that I'm willing to take uh, because, well, you know, it's. Um, it's there's no uh, alternative at this point for unless we do it all digitally. And uh, I don't know that everyone's on the same page as far as doing that. Uh, you know, that right, the, the crucible of cross examination, as they call it. Right. So having that witness in the in the witness stand under the gun and in, in, in the heat of questioning, uh, there is some intangible quality that elicits the truth from the witnesses when they're done in person like that. I, do I buy that? I don't know, but it, that's uh, that's the theory, anyways. So, and at this time, with a witness in front of you with their mask on, you with your mask on, everybody else with their masks on, trying to hear what's going on, is that actually superior than what I just described with everybody comfortable in their seats? With, as I said, as we do this cost kind of benefit analysis as attorneys, one hundred percent guaranteed safety as opposed to never being able to guarantee safety and relying on both the honor system in your questionnaire, the fact that a, you have a virus that has a very long gestation period, and all the other things that actually go into the dangers that we've, you know, we've been talking about with science and all this stuff for this entire time. Now, I guess here's my real question, because I see a lot of benefits to doing trials by video. Um, I, I see some stuff like, I mean, just for me, um, I was truly a convert to this thing when I had a um, I had an evidentiary hearing in Albuquerque at 11 o'clock one morning, and I had an um, evidentiary trial in uh, a fairly large evidentiary trial in uh, Taos at one o'clock that afternoon. I had time to have lunch and a leisurely coffee in between. Most importantly, I did not put my butt behind a wheel of a car and risk myself, which you know, before COVID was the most dangerous thing I did as a modern human being was get behind the wheel of a car. Now, of course, it's shopping. But I mean, at the time, you know, one of my as a personal injury attorney, I had this soapbox about be safe out there because it is so dangerous to drive. I have not actually risked myself behind the wheel of a car hardly at all during this stuff. And oddly, I'm more productive than I was before because I can get more stuff done without just spending a lot of time traveling or a lot of time, you know, with all the logistical stuff it takes to get places. I can get off a meeting and within five minutes be on a, a giant hearing with a whole bunch of people. Um, I like the ability to have accessibility to the court. You know, handicap access is not really a thing if you, everybody can do it but from their own office and their own computer. Let, let, me, right now to get let me ask you this though. So what does that look like then? Do all the jurors stay home and then watch the, the, the video of the trial at home? Or how does that work? How do you make it completely digital? 
I, you know, I think the simplest way to do it right now, because we've already done this by um, by uh, in bench trials, right? So we've got Google Meet set up. We've got the, the platforms easy to use and stuff like this. I actually, you know, my eyes were kind of opened. Um, I have a daughter who is 14 and she goes to Albuquerque Public Schools. And APS did some very interesting things in a really quick manner, which is, you know, my hat's off to APS. Because uh, what they did was uh, when the school year started this last year and we were basically locked down and the kids hadn't gone to school all summer, they issued everybody a Chromebook. Now, this is APS students, right? I mean, you got to expect your average juror, hopefully, at least if their name's on a juror list somewhere, they are going to be at least as responsible with a Chromebook as, you know, our, anyway. So, but they have the ability to control the hardware, the tech, the software, and the security. And so, you know, you could get that to every single person. They can either pick it up themselves, have somebody pick it up for them. Now, the other thing is I have an older daughter who goes to school out in Oregon, and she's doing it here in Albuquerque. She takes classes uh, such as math, uh, science classes, and stuff like that, that require certain um, restrictions when she takes tests. There's this proctoring software that will basically watch what she does. It restricts access to her um, other programs, it restricts access to any streaming services, it restricts access to anything except the ability to take the test that she's doing. And through the camera, just like in the Chromebooks my kids have, through the camera, a proctor watches. And every once in a while, when she starts test, she's supposed to pick up the computer, like show it around the room to show that her phone's not there, the books aren't there and all that kind of stuff. And she'll put it down and she'll start the test. And then at certain points, she'll get a message or something like that, you know, show us the room or, or whatever the message is. And she'll do the same thing to make sure, you know, to keep honest students honest. Mm. She said, she told me a story one time, uh, one of her cats walked in front of the uh, in front of the camera while she was taking the test. Within a couple of minutes, a proctor said, would you please show me the room or something like that? So mm. there is ways, there are ways. You know, right now we have, I mean, that would take one person as a proctor for what, 12 jurors? Yeah. So, and right now we have people who support jurors down at the courthouse. We actually have to set room aside. We have to support jurors. You know, we have to give them bathrooms. We have to have infrastructure, a lot of things for jurors. It would be a heck of a lot cheaper if we didn't have to do both. If we just had everybody get a Chromebook, you know, you're issued your Chromebook and when you're done with jury duty, you better give it back to us or we're gonna send you a fine for a hundred bucks or something. But you know, there are ways of enforcing this stuff and yeah. we have mechanisms already in place to do this successfully and keep honest jurors honest, I think. Oh, okay, but well, what about this? What about the idea, I mean, you know, uh, I've had, uh, I've tried a number of cases uh, having worked at the DA's office, and one of the issues you ran into is jurors just falling asleep uh, in person, right? I, I can't imagine, you know, as, as entertaining as Zoom is and, and watching a video is, I just feel like the, the uh, risk factor for jurors nodding off is probably a lot higher. Uh, but, but more to the substantive point, how do you ensure, is, is the information that goes to the jurors the same in its quantity and quality as it is in person? The Solutions Group. The State Bar of New Mexico's EAP provider offers confidential and free professional counselors to support employees and their direct family members by offering short-term counseling, assessments, and referrals for any life struggle. This includes drug addiction, relationship conflict, anxiety, depression, and grief and loss. Other services include dependent care, crisis assessment and intervention, educational presentations, free well-being webinars, and an online stress assessment tool. Call 505-254-3555 or 1-866-254-3555 and identify with NMJ Lab to schedule an appointment or video visit. And I, and I guess at a certain point, you know, we've been taught for years um, that juries are increasingly learning by screens, by video. You know, That's we good. try to we take a lot of effort to put our stuff on um, uh, on PowerPoint presentations. We we put videos together. We we do a lot uh, to to apply technology.
technology to the presentations we do, even when we do it in person. So is all the studies and the CLEs that I've been getting over the last few years say that our populations as they get older, you know, these younger populations um, actually increasingly learn by almost exclusively by a screen. Read all your books on a screen. You get all your stuff on computers or TVs or streaming or some other device that actually gives you a screen. They may actually, we may actually, because I've actually, the same generation, you know, I watch TV, I have a phone. I, I These days, I try not to actually look at paper at all, but that's more because the older I get, the larger I like my letters to be. Um, but I have the ability to learn all the stuff I need to on screens and I have it at my fingertips. My kids, I mean, don't hand them a book. They, they, they love books, but typically what they learn from, and then right now, they are exclusively learning from at least an APS screens. Yeah, but isn't there? Isn't there? I, I mean, I hear what you're saying, and I agree with that. That that is the mode and the method that we're doing now. But aren't there some some studies out there or something like that that say your retention from screen learning is lower than if you read from a book or if you uh, non-screen learning? I mean, I don't I don't have any sites to that or anything, but I thought I, I thought I've heard that somewhere. Um, no, I think, you know, there's, there's, there's never going to be perfect ways of imparting information. And, and we will always make decisions, and juries will too, based on imperfect information and, to a certain extent, imperfect presentation. But we have the ability to do better, I think, all the time. Now, for instance, when I first started as a lawyer, I actually learned how to get all my statutes and all my law and my cases from these archaic things called books. We had things like libraries where all these books were kept and we would go to those libraries and we would get information. I, I, it would be malpractice to do that today. I don't, you know, I remember a few years back when they got it. You know, it's a book. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. It's a book with post-it notes. I'm, I'm showing, I'm showing uh, Rick my book that I use. Uh, it's not a screen, just a book. You know, that's it hurts, really it hurts when you make a mistake, you can pound it. You know, it's good prop too. Yeah. But no, I, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, no, no. I, I, I agree. You know, and I love books, but you know, one of the best gifts that was ever given to me a long time ago was a, a librarian at UNM Library, the law library, taught me how to research with Westlaw and LexisNexis. So I, you know, especially a few years ago, and I saw there was a notice that, hey, does anybody want the Shepherd citations? Because we're going to get rid of them. We're not going to use them anymore. Because basically, it was that archaic system where you had to go from book to book, updating your law anyway. I have, I, if an opinion was issued yesterday, I have it at my fingertips. Yeah. So our practice has benefited from the advance of technology, I think, considerably over the short time I have been a lawyer. Um, and, I, and I'm very grateful for it. I think as lawyers, I look at what I could have done with books and old school methods of doing stuff. I am far more productive even without the video lawyering stuff today, just because I have access to more tools, I can do more but stuff. Let me let me let me in, interject there and say I agree with that, uh, and I think that it would it would be the legal community would be better served if everyone got on that same page. I'll tell you a quick uh, example. I had a long time ago. I had a hearing where we had an evidentiary hearing on. Um, it was a uh, it was a conditions of release hearing, and so if you look at the rules of evidence and the miscellaneous rules eleven eleven, it talks about whether the rules of evidence apply to conditions of release hearings. So I had opposing counsel saying because I was bringing up a defendant's criminal history and other charges as a reasons uh, for to impose a higher bond on a conditions of release hearing, and they objected to hearsay, right? That's hearsay. All those other things are hearsay. Whatever he did. And so I said, Judge 11110 whatever says that rules don't apply. And I had it pulled up on my website on my computer, my laptop at the, you know, the NM Compilation Commission rules, but I didn't have my book. And the judge says, well, counsel, do you have a copy of the rules? And uh, I did not have my book. And uh, so I said, well, I have it right here on my computer. And the judge was not willing to accept that. Uh, and so because they didn't have the, the book there at the time, uh, that um, objection was sustained. Uh, and so, I, I, hey, if we're going to get on board and all, all do digital, fine, but everybody's got to be on board for, in order for it to work. You know, I, 100%. And I, and I agree, you know, because right now we're talking about necessity. 
we, we got to find a way to get stuff done. You know, we're all out of our comfort zone. Um, no, nobody's, you know, we're just trying to find a way to get stuff done. Um, but I think, you know, toward that end, uh, we, we should apply some of the analytical tools that we apply to our clients, to what we're doing in our profession. And I think to start with that, look at the goals of what our profession is doing. Are we supposed to try to serve our clients, make things cost effective, speedy, um, get justice in effective way, of which a massive part of that is our jury system. So we have to find a way to be able to do this stuff. There are, and, and, and this is, I guess this is one of the things, because I, I do, I apply an analytical kind of model to what I do, because that's how I was taught kind of to help my clients do what they need to do. Everybody has their own problems. I'm not the decision maker, but I'm the one who gives them the information and advice to allow them to make those decisions. So I help them sometimes do cost benefit analysis or something like that. And I think as a part of that, we start by understanding what our goals are. What, what are the goals of the whole system and who do we serve? Well, we serve our clients, right? To a certain extent, we serve the court through our positions as officers of the court, but the whole system is designed to get justice, fairness, and all that stuff that we usually don't talk about because, you know, we're barely trying to keep up. You know, we were busy before the pandemic hit, and this hasn't helped anything. And we're trying to figure out how to do this stuff, but we have analy analytical tools that we use on a daily basis to make these decisions. So I guess, you know, one of the, the questions I really have is what can you get up Aside from that, how shall I say, intangible quality of just being there. And of course, there's that other human factor that goes into almost all decision making. It's because the way we've always done stuff, which is, I think, a terrible basis for making decisions, especially in a life or death situations like a pandemic. But what can you actually get out of a trial in person that you cannot get out of a trial by video, and I mean entirely by video, because if you don't have everybody in the same room, that's the only way you're gonna be 100% safe right now. But what can you get out of that in-person trial that you can't get out of a trial by video that outweighs that life or death analysis? Yeah, no, I, I um, just playing devil's advocate, because that's what we lawyers do, uh, you know, as far as, I see it from the criminal standpoint. If I'm a criminal defendant and I'm accused of a crime, I want my day in court. I want to see that person, look them in the eye, not through a video screen, but I want to be there because there is something, I mean, is, is what is the, hmm, the intangible, uh, how that by its nature, it's, you can't measure it. It's intangible. Uh, but uh, when you're in person and you're being questioned, I mean, I know when someone questions me in person, it's a lot different than I'm sitting here in a, in a video. There's a distance uh, to the person who's asking you the questions. Uh, it is not as intense. It's not as high pressure. It doesn't get your blood pumping as much. It doesn't get your adrenaline up. So uh, the, to that, if I'm a criminal defendant, I want people in person. I want to I want to I want to put them through that crucible uh, to see, you know, uh, what it is they say when they're under pressure, when they can just think about their answers and, and sit back in a comfy chair and, you know, have popcorn next to them. You know, I'm exaggerating, of course. Uh, but is it the same? Is it the same when it's when it's a uh, almost a, a distance questioning? Now, to that, I don't know the answer, but I'll tell you this. In the in the depositions that I have done via video, uh, people forget that they're on camera. Uh, when they're in that situation, and you can see their uh, facial expressions that they think are private because there's no one else in the room with them, and sometimes those are are uh, those break their case, uh, especially when they when they have smirks and, and snide comments where they think they've made a a dig, and it does it will not play well. Well, it certainly didn't play well in our case to the mediator, uh, but it certainly it might not play to the uh, to the jurors as well. Um, if you get that all recorded. So, but I, I get you what you're saying. It's cost benefit analysis. I mean, we have, um, does that little bit of intangible outweigh the risk of death? 
Uh, <laughs> I can't answer that question. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I, I, I'm a civil guy. I, I don't do any criminal stuff. I, I'm afraid all my clients would go to jail. I, um, uh, but, you know, and it's funny because I, I live a life of uh, burdens and proof. If I go to a judge with damages or an element that is so intangible, I cannot actually elucidate it. I won't get it. You know what I mean? But I understand that. I miss being in person. I, I, I was a bartender for 20 years. I mean, I, I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. If anything, you know, I, I try to rely on some of my people skills over any kind of, you know what I mean? I, it, it, I miss the, the give and take. I, I miss the being in person, the depositions, the mediations, the ability to have that human contact. I think it adds to our profession. And, and, I, and I really look forward to it coming back. But I think there's stuff that we've learned in this process that would benefit us going forward. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of reasons to continue this. Um, I find it so much easier and cheaper to do depositions all over the country right now when I don't have to travel to a defendant and spend all that money going and doing the deposition. I can talk expert witnesses into taking 15 minutes from their practice, go into their office, get on their computer, testify for me at an evidentiary hearing successfully and then go back to their practice a lot easier than I could say, can you set aside a whole afternoon, set, you know, take all your patients and all that stuff and take most of your time to deal with parking, um, security, which by the way, I was struck by when you were talking about a defend a criminal defendant facing their accuser. This, I have not actually feared for my security by anybody at the court since we've been doing this. I don't know if you remember a few years ago, there was a guy shot up on our second floor because he brought a, a knife into the courthouse. Um, mm -hmm. It was a domestic relations thing. It was ugly, but you know, there's security issues down there. That's why we've got metal detectors. That's why we've got all this stuff. Frankly, right now we're safer. Our judges are safer. Our witnesses are safer. Just from all the normal stuff, not even the pandemic. You know what I mean? Then you add the pandemic on top of all that stuff. I mean, security was always an issue. Um, and in my life practice, you know, I, I'm kind of a nut. I got kids. I'm a personal injury guy. Safety first. You know, I, I, I get in trouble for telling all my kids all those terrible stories about accident. Oh, and I had a client that did this. And it's like, they just, dad, you just see all the worst and everything. And it's like, no, I see the possible consequences of actions that we take right now because I've seen it happen. And one of the things that kind of drives me crazy right now is, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a negligence guy. It is foreseeable that our actions right now are going to have consequences in the immediate future and in the far future. We just predicted right now, now it's February, but we're, we're doing this on February 2nd. It's predicted by uh, scientists in the CDC that in March, the most predominant variant of COVID-19 is going to be this UK virus that is far more virulent and is going to cause far easily more transmissible disease is my understanding that, you know, more people are going to catch it a lot more easily. So if we see that coming in the months to come, why are we doing things like putting people together in this month now, February 1st? And I question things like APS's decision to try to do in-person teaching or in-person learning right now, when you cannot inoculate or you cannot vaccinate people under 16 per the COVID uh, protocols right now, all the teachers have not been vaccinated. Nothing has actually changed about when we put a whole bunch of people together who have not been vaccinated in a time of even more dangerous transmissibility, I guess would be the word. Why are we taking the actions now that are making it more likely in about a month or two to have to shut all this stuff down again? We're doing some pretty good stuff right now. Why don't we keep doing what we're doing? Yeah. And that is and that is pretty much everything remotely. I, I can't do anything until we get everybody vaccinated. Nobody in my family is leaving until everybody in my family is vaccinated because, like I said, I have people in the house that we just can't take a chance. We, we know that it will be disastrous if they get sick. So we just don't do the things that will do that. And we still worry about whether that's enough or not. Yeah. Now, to, to, to build on your, uh, you know, the negligence, you know, is it foreseeable? But then, of course, you have to say, well, did they take reasonable steps uh, to mitigate that foreseeable risk of harm, right? So what are those reasonable steps? 
just play, again playing devil's advocate and, and, and i i agree with you that i would prefer till this everything is under control we put a, a postponement on uh, on gatherings for example i i'm you know not because i'm unprepared but i wouldn't mind uh if the supreme court paused jury trials and we just try this thing a couple months from now but um that's not the case and you know i'd say probably half of americans well who knows how many but a lot of americans ascribe to the philosophy of you know uh you know, who somebody said oh, some one of our founding fathers said something to the effect of those who desire security over freedom deserve neither and so you know you should you should be able to uh do the things that are you know constitutional right trial by jury uh in person because that's what everybody's used to um that i mean and so the mask the distancing are those reasonable precautions well to your point it's it's not a non-zero risk there's still a risk and especially with those gatherings um yeah i don't know i it's a uh, not not something uh currently that <laughs> i'm looking necessarily forward to uh but it's it's you know we do, we have not yet implemented all the things we need to do in order to get it completely virtual uh like you're talking about those chromebooks to all the jurors or some some mechanism to ensure that everybody can participate uh without being there in person and that really just takes a change of thinking everything's in place we have all the tools the resources we could steal the hardware software or steal borrow as a lawyer i steal everything i know because there's no there's no reward at law for originality but you know there is stuff out there you can use we could do this all it would take would be a change of intent and a change of thinking and an order by the supreme court um to just give it a try I, for, to my knowledge yeah, we were going to be one of the i was going to be a, entirely video but then my opposing counsel had asked for a hybrid why not try give it a bunch of tries because it's going to be we're going to have to practice this but we've done it pretty successfully by bench um and you know, I, I, there's the downside, you know, as lawyers, um, at, at least as a civil practice lawyer, um, I was always taught um, that you weigh the steps you take to avoid a risk by how great that risk is. For example, if I if I am risking a $20 fine, I don't spend 40 bucks trying to avoid that $20 fine. It just doesn't make any sense. However, for the risk I'm trying to avoid is dying, well, then that's worth more than 40 bucks. So, and I'm not sure, I'm not going to tell you where that lands in there, but the steps we take to avoid dying are a lot greater than the stakes we, attempt, we take to avoid fines, things like that. We are in kind of a unique, well, I would submit once every hundred years or so, so far, is when we've had a pandemic. Now, we take special precautions in special times. We've had wars. We've, Lincoln suspended habeas corpus. I mean, there are times when we just got to get through this. We got to suck it up and get through this. As a lifestyle, this sucks. There's, I, I don't know anybody who's going to argue, this doesn't suck. I'm not advocating we want to do this forever. But I would like to be a more productive attorney. And I've found that this video stuff will help in the future, too, as long as we can get people to agree on it. But no, I don't want to do this either. I mean, frankly, I really look forward to the time I can go have a dinner at a restaurant or something you know without having to worry about dying from it um but i think you know as we head towards the future as lawyers we have an obligation to find better ways to do things in general this is a very expensive thing most of the people i know who want to actually have representation are priced out of this business and that's because of the cost of litigation and the cost of attorney fees i have judges who still insist I show up to a 15 minute hearing in a county three and a half hours away, which costs my client over a thousand dollars just in traveling time. Why? What do I get out of that? What does he get out of that 15 minute hearing that wouldn't be better spent on my client actually saving those resources to be a human being? I actually represent human beings. I used to represent insurance companies. They didn't seem to mind that so much because they had all our money anyway. So it wasn't like, that was such a thing, though it is a great deal when I represent real people because real people find it hard to pay for lawyers. Lawyers are expensive. 
That's why this personal injury thing's so good. I remember you have this contingency fee. I get all my money from the insurance company anyway. Both sides get all their money from the insurance company. So, I mean, that works real well. But when real people have to pay for attorney fees, that cost-benefit analysis is a painful one. Yeah, no, I, I, uh, we're in agreement on that. That uh, it's uh, if you bill, if you if you don't recover, uh, that's a lot of cost to incur for a fifteen-minute hearing just to say, uh, okay, we now have a scheduling order. And I, and I very much enjoy the ability to meet judges. I very much enjoy the ability to meet my opposing counsel and stuff. Uh, frankly, uh, over the last year, I have had clients that I have met. They've retained me. I've done their entire case. They're well on their way. I have, I have no idea what they look like. I've never met them. Um, I know what their idea looks like. I, I, I've gotten their signature on my fee agreements. I've done a lot of work on their behalf, and I've got stuff. But I have never been in their presence, nor, had I, nor did I have to be to actually get the job done. Let me, and, and let me been, ask you this, Rick. Um, but what about, so just one more, one more what about this question for you. So the courthouse steps settlements, how can we replicate that via Zoom? I mean, how do you, you know, it's, it's a lot easier to say, hey, let's, let's talk for a minute and the case gets settled. But if you're doing trial by video, do you want to just do a breakout room and then talk there? Or how does that work? No, you're right. Yeah, you know, and, and that's that is the one thing that I that I have not found a way to replicate. Although I have found that I do get on the phone more often with my opposing counsel now than I did before this. Um, and I've gotten a couple of cases settled by just getting on the phone. Um, but no, you're you're not wrong in that one. Um, and, and part of what you know, I think is uh, this podcast, and I think the discussion we're having is I really do would like to hear other people's ideas. I mean, I always think I'm right. Uh, I don't always win, so there's some objective evidence out there that I'm not always right. Mm -hmm. So um, I'd love to hear, you know, other people's opinions and to find out how people are doing in trials, especially how you're doing in this one coming up next week. I'll let you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know the trials aren't easy in the best of times, and, and, and these are not the best of times. No. Yeah. yeah. I'll, uh, if, you, if you don't hear from me shortly after the trial, it did not go well. <laughs> <laughs> well i wish you the best of luck sean and i sure appreciate you being here today yeah thanks rick it's been a, a, a pleasure to talk with you and and uh hopefully we'll keep we'll keep going on these lawyering by video stuff thank you for listening this episode was produced by the state bar of new mexico's well-being committee and the new mexico judges and lawyers assistance program all editing and sound mixing was done by Blue Sky Ebler. Intro music is by Kevin McLeod at IncomTech. The views of the presenters are that of their own and are not endorsed by the State Bar of New Mexico. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment or legal advice. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition.